Uh, so I understand that you're an adequate opposer of socialism. Uh, my, my question to you, to you is about socialist ideas that have worked in the past, such as Social Security or Medicare. I understand Social Security, so social security is a mess right now, but it has helped millions of Americans in the past. So do you think that we should banish socialist ideas in general in the United States or limit it? To banish. Like um, and the reason I say that is because Social, so what socialism basically does is it takes the resources of a given society and it freezes them there and then it redistributes them. It doesn't account for growth, it doesn't allow for innovation and, uh, and enlarging the pie. Socialism basically says, however much money is in the economy, it's unfair how it's distributed, take it, redistribute it, that's the end of it. The problem is once you do that, you get rid of the incentive to innovate and to, and to build new things and create new services. So, of course it's true that if you take if, you, if there are five of us in a room and I have five dollars and nobody else has any money and I just give each person a dollar, then everybody in the room is better off except for me. That's true, but I now know have, I have no incentive to go out and make five more dollars because you're all just going to take the money. This is true of Social Security also. So social Security has actually created an enormous downside for society now. So in the short term, it's great, right? You take a bunch of money that doesn't belong to you, you give it to a bunch of old people, they're happy. It didn't cost you that much money because it's the baby boom and there are a lot of people who are young and there are not that many people who are old. Then the baby boomers get old and now we're all screwed, right? People who are our age are never gonna see our social security money. It's gone, we're never seeing it again, kiss it goodbye, right? So, it, 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 so one problem is that older people did not have an incentive to save. So the savings rate actually went down after social security because you may as well spend your money, somebody else is gonna pay for you when you're old. The second thing that happened is people stopped having kids as much. It actually had a market impact. Jonathan B. Lass at Weekly Standard is a very good book about this. Uh, there's a, it actually had a market impact on birth rates because one of the reasons to have a kid, not to be cynical about this, but it's true, is that historically, when you get old, who takes care of you? Your kids, right? I mean, that was the net cost. The net cost was that you were going to spend an enormous amount of money educating your children, bringing them up, keeping them safe, and then when you got old, you weren't going to have to worry about it because little Billy was going to take care of you. Now Social Security takes care of you, so do you even have to have kids? And that's what's created this enormous bulge in the old population in the United States and very little on the, in, on the young side of the population in the United States. Uh, and because as a society we tend to abdicate to government what government is willing to take over, it's also created this immoral notion that the government's gonna take care of all the bold people so we don't have to worry about it as a society. Social fabric doesn't matter anymore. So this is why I'm not in favor of socialism, you know, and, and Social Security is a good example. I'm not in favor of it because it has just like every other socialist program, it has a set of discrete beneficiaries, but diffuse victims. And the diffuse victims are much more common than the discrete beneficiaries, and they grow over time. Okay, thank you. Please kick Chank's ass tonight, please. Hi, howdy. Fact number one, transgender is not a disease. This is not my opinion. This is facts from the World Health Organization and the American Psychology Association. Just like don't, gay people don't have a disease. Fact number two, right, rich beautiful. kids stay rich, poor kids stay poor. Out of, one, out of 1,800 billionaires in the world, 12 of them are black. Where you come from, where you grow up, how much your parents earn, whether your parents are, were married plays a major role in determining yeah, I know where you're there a question mark at the end. Fact number three, I would just question like mark. to remind you that hate speech is not free speech. Yes, it is. And my and question is, since facts don't care about your feelings, why did you use false facts? Okay, so none of the facts that I used are false. First of all, yes. Uh, no, okay, first of all, uh, would you like the answer? Okay, so the, first, so the three facts you mentioned, you talked about transgenderism. First of all, until five minutes ago, the DSM specifically defined transgenderism as a disorder. It defined it as gender identity disorder, now it calls it gender dysmorphia, which doesn't even make sense. It says that depression is the actual problem, not the actual gender disorder, which again does not explain why the transgender suicide rate is upward of 40%, and the actual suicide rate for the rest of the American population is lower than 3%. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you talked about income inequality, and you suggested that all wealth is inherited. This is nonsense. According to, according to the IRS statistics, if you are born into the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States, you will not be one of the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States. 90% of people will not be within 15 years. There's tremendous wage mobility in the United States of America. Plus, there is not a group of people who just sit at the very top and stay there. People move up and down, in and out of the 1%. 1% just defines the line of income it doesn't define the people who are in that 1% of income. I've been in the 1%, I've been out of the 1%. It will happen to lots of people. People who are older tend to be more likely to be in the 1%. They weren't once in the 1%, what happened? 
OK, so that's number two. Number three, you say hate speech is not free speech. It depends how you define hate speech. The only speech that is not free speech is speech that overtly defends or pushes violence. Specifically, speech that is, that is generating violence. Right? That's the only type of speech that's not hate speech. If I say things you don't like, that's not hate speech. And if you think that, that it is hate speech, you're a fascist. End of story. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, what I said about income inequality is a few things. Number one, the idea that the people who are very, very rich somehow stole from the people who are very, very poor, and that's why they're very, very rich is stupid. Poor people are poor and don't have lots of money to steal. Okay, so the idea that, if you, that Bill Gates got rich by ripping off a bunch of homeless people. Homeless people were not buying Microsoft, nor was he going to them, forcing Microsoft on them for them to stick into their boxes. Right? Like that's not, how, that's not how he got rich. The way you get rich in any free functioning economy is by participating in an enormous number of voluntary transactions that benefit both sides. You should care about the question of poverty. You shouldn't care about the question of income inequality. You should care about how do we make poor people rich, not how do we make rich people poorer so that everybody's at the same level. Because that's just you being jealous. That's just you not liking the guy's house next door because it's bigger than your house. And look at that, he has a big house, I have a smaller house, maybe I'll just go rob his place. Right? That's, not, that's not moral, and it's not decent, and it's also not true. The fact is that while the left decries income inequality, the evils of capitalism, since 1994, the, the world extreme poverty rate has been sliced in half by increased capitalism and, and by free markets. Right? I mean, the free markets that are now being bashed left and right, those free markets are the greatest innovation in the history of humanity when it comes to the economy. It's why you have nice stuff. It's why you're not sitting in your backyard right now crafting your own handmade tie from a, from a sheep that you had to shear yourself. I mean, there's a, I thought there's a, there's a great thing. I mean, just there's a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a caveat on trade. I thought my favorite story of the last few months, there was some guy who decided that he wanted to make himself a BLT and see how much it costs to make the whole thing himself, right, like from scratch. So he actually went and he bought a cow and then he, and, and he, and he like, Killed the cow and, and, he, and he went out and he got a pig and like he like he went out and he did he he got he, he milked and he made the cheese he went out and he he grew some wheat and then he milled it right this whole thing it cost him sixteen hundred dollars to make a BLT and it took him six months right you can go down to your local restaurant and get a BLT for five bucks because of global trade and because freedom of, of of income and the fact is that when people talk about income inequality what they're really saying is. They don't understand how money works. They think that if, if there's two people in a room, one person with five bucks, one person with one, the person with five stole from the person with one. It doesn't ask the question, how did the person get poor? The reality is if you don't want to be permanently poor in America, it's very, very easy. The Brookings Institute, which is a left-leaning institute, they say you only have to do three things. Graduate high school, don't have babies out of wedlock, get a job. That's it. Those are the three things. 75% of the people who do those three things will end up in the middle class. Not just not poor, in the middle class. Only 2% of people who do those three things end up permanently poor in the United States. So the idea that, there's, that it's the rich people keeping the poor people down and they're doing it for their own pleasure, their own sick pleasure. Bill Gates, has, for sport, he shoots poor people from the balcony of his mansion. It's just, it, it's asinine in every conceivable way. Uh, and, and it's so funny. I, I did a debate on National Geographic that never aired. Uh, it never aired because it was brutal. Uh, and <laughs> it was me against three, which made it almost fair for them. And it was, it was like Van Jones, and uh, I think Van Jones is on the other side, uh, and some professor from NYU, and, uh, and they, they, it was exactly on this topic. And I said to them, are you proposing that we actually just kill the rich people and redistribute their money? And they said no. And I said to them, why are you, why are you talking about the rich people? What did they do? And they didn't have an answer because they don't know what the rich people did. They just know they want their cash. The, the idea that income inequality is correlated in any way with overall poverty is really silly. There are countries with really high income inequality and very low overall poverty. That's like the United States. There are countries with zero income inequality, Sudan, and nobody has anything. Right? So the idea that the differential is the, is the statistic that matters, it doesn't. The fact is in the United States, 9 out of 10 Americans are living above the global middle income standard. Right? Everybody in the United States is rich by global standards. And that, that you, know, you want to get rid of the income inequality by destroying that. Good luck to you. Uh, for introducing me to Harambe memes. <laughs> uh, well, last week, his memory. Uh, last week, John Oliver used his show as a call to arms to support Planned Parenthood because Republicans have the House, the Senate, the White House. Do you anticipate pushback within the Republican Party if the pro-life movement tries to move forward with its, agen its agenda in the next two years? I, I mean, this is a really good question. I'm not sure how committed Donald Trump is to, for example, reversing funding for Planned Parenthood, right? He said early in the primaries that he, that he liked Planned Parenthood. He thought that they did some good work. 
it'll be interesting to see if he clashes with the new Congress over that, because clearly Paul Ryan and a lot of other members of Congress would like to withdraw federal funding uh, for Planned Parenthood. Obviously, I think that's a good idea. I think abor abortion is immoral, and the idea that I'm paying for somebody, else to, somebody else's baby to be killed uh, seems pretty ridiculous morally, ethically, you know, legally to me. I think all of it's really dubious. Uh, it, it, is, it is definitely questionable. As far as John Oliver, uh, you know, it, we, we have a really bad habit in this country of taking everybody seriously if they have a British accent. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and that seems to me uh, a bad mistake. We, we ought to judge John Oliver by the, the content of his speech, not the quality thereof.